about boom towns, the towns that were promoted like they now promote subdivisions in Los Angeles. They were systematically land developments. No one reading from our scrapbook, no matter how skimpy, could be complete without the stories of boom towns. They were pretty much the same in pattern. Promoters from Tacoma, Seattle, and Portland and other larger cities who had cleaned up in real estate in those places watched the swing of activity. When they saw things opening up somewhere around the state, they jumped right in and started to develop a town. There was Dermond, around on Shoalwater Bay, Willapa Harbor to us now. It hardly got further than a blueprint. Napoleon, Washington was another one of those sites. It was plotted to take in what is now Think of Me Hill, Dabney Heights, and the hills above the entrance to Aberdeen. It was never even dignified with the name of a town, but it was plotted and a few lots sold. Well, probably the two best known boom towns here about were Acosta and Grays Harbor City. The promoters of those towns had a little more to hang their campaign on. They did a better job, and there was more of a story to them. You see, the railroad was considered the key to a town when it was down this way. There was no railroad here in the 1880s. Everything moved by boat. But as people began to move this way, it was predicted that the railroad would soon follow. Now the question was, where would the railroad terminate? And here on the harbor, there were other questions. Which side of the harbor would it come down? Those questions provided the steam for a lot of red-hot competition. On the south side, of the river was Cosmopolis, South Aberdeen, and a number of little settlements scattered along the shore at Johns River, O'Leary Creek, South Bay, and Peterson's Point, which is now Westport. On the North Shore, Aberdeen and Hopewiam were competing for the rail lines. Well, while the local citizens were scurrying around trying to steer the railroad down one side of the harbor or the other, and trying to get it to stop in their town so that the shops and terminals would be located there, some outsiders took a hand in things, two groups of them to be exact. One group set their side on the south side of the river, the other lined up a promotion for the north side. And it's that bunch that wanted to build a city on the north side that we're going to talk about tonight. They were the founding geniuses of Grays Harbor City. Now before I get this story, I might say that there are two Grays Harbor cities shown on the map of Grays Harbor County. There's one on the north side of the harbor and one just across from it on the south side. They both blossomed about the same time, though perhaps blossomed is not the word for the one over there near Acosta. It budded on paper, then withered and died without more than the most futile gesture of being a city. But the Grays Harbor City over on the north side, that's a different story. As boom towns go, it was a big, it was a big bubble as Virginia City, Nevada. And that's the Grays Harbor City that our story is about tonight. Now just before we begin, let's survey the Grays Harbor of the early 1880s. It was populated with a scattering of families along both sides of the muddy beaches. West of what is now Hopewim, there were the James at Hopewim. George Emerson gathered a small settlement around a sawmill. Sam Ben had a town platted by 1884 and a few buildings up and across the Wishka River was the town of Wishka, with a sawmill and a cluster of wooden huts. Further upriver, not far from what is now Junction City, San Ben had a cannery, and across the river was Fry Sawmill, a water-powered 
converted grist mill that turned out lumber with a sash saw at a rate of a plank every so often. There was a cluster of huts there that referred to as Cosmopolis, though Cosmopolis did not come into being until the 1880s were half gone. Then along the harbor going west, the voyager would pass O'Leary's lone dwelling at O'Leary's Creek, the Fry's house at John's River, and a few houses where Acosta now stands, and finally sight the harbor's metropolis, the city of Chehalis, over on Peterson's Point, now Westport. That town started out as Leo City, though that was a way back and was never really included in the plot of the county. Then the same people, Sam Williams and Tom Carter and some others, platted the town of Chehalis. That was trying to become a city about 1884, and that was it. Then along about that time, the boom came. Some of the promoters of Grays Harbor City were Tacoma men. Others were Eastern capitalists who had lived in Tacoma long enough to get their mail transferred there. They looked the harbor over and thought that the site beyond Hoquiam offered a good bet for a town. Aberdeen and Hoquiam were snorting along as sawmill towns, building up piles of sawdust, and the promoters felt that the railroad would have to come down the north side of the harbor. They figured if there was another town, one beyond Hoquiam, the railroad would extend to it, and it would be the western terminus of one of the big transcontinental lines. Not bad reasoning, as promoters do it, and it was on the basis of their sales talk. So to ensure a railroad, they must have dealt with George W. Hunt of Walker Waller, who was prospecting and looking for a line. They bought a chunk of timberland down there just about north of Moon Island Airport today and laid out the plat. The late Jim Bowes, one of the grand old timers who helped tack this county together, once told me that it was the unlikeliest site for a town he had ever seen. They just scattered lots and blocks, Jim said. It looked like they have parceled out a lot of blocks and streets and then just threw them into the landscape. But on paper it looked good. Well, Jim sh should have known the whole story. He swung an axe to clear the streets of virgin trees when they were building Grays Harbor City. The promoters organized what they called the Grays Harbor Company and when they had the plot worked out it was filed in the county at Montesano. That historic day was July 15, 1889. The boom was on. Grays Harbor City was immediately given the name, the Terminus. Of course, to infer that the termination of the transcontinental line was an accomplished fact. To sell their lots, the promoters fanned the flock of salespeople across the country as far east as Iowa and all down through Kansas and Nebraska to sell lots. It made a speculator's sales story. Termination of the transcontinental line right on one of the finest harbors in the Pacific coast where land and water meet. New city, chance to get on, on the ground floor. No wonder the Easterners bit, and they did. They bought and started west. Papers throughout the Northwest carried bold ads telling of the splendid sale of lots in the first addition to the town, the date that the lots would be available. It was the morning of the 15th of October, 1890. To buy a choice lot, you had to be at the Grays Harbor Company land office on Summit Avenue in Grays Harbor City itself. But they came from Portland, from Tacoma, and from Harbor Cities. They came with their money in their hands. All through the night of October 14th, they came into Grays Harbor City. They came by the boatload down the river. They tied up their teams and they took their place in the growing queue at the door of the land office. The morning sun disclosed an exciting lineup of farmers, fishermen, timber workers from the west 
and a sprinkling of eastern moneyed investors. There were buildings now, a few homes started, a store, a saloon. When the land office opened, they were crowded in, those eager speculators, to plunk down their greenbacks for choice corner lots and business sites. Before the day was over, a million dollars worth had been sold. Two men had cornered $130,000 worth by paying down one-third in cash. The river boats were now stopping at the long dock that reached nearly a mile out into the harbor. You see, when the promoters advertised where the rail and water will meet, they meant almost meet. There was really no harbor there. They had to stretch pilings far more than 4,000 feet out into the bay to find water deep enough for even a light draft schooner and a river boat of that time to, dar to dock. But the river boats were now bringing their loads, and the families crowded in to what were, they would be sure the metropolis of the West. In the year that followed, Grace Harbor City built a hotel, more stores, seven saloons, and scores of pretty new homes with the latest gaieties of the gay 90s gingerbreading. There was a bakery, a tailor shop, and a town. Or was it a city? Began to look like it was prophesied. But as the weeks went on, nothing came to bring stability to the venture. The sawmills were being built where ships had navigable waters. The Northern Pacific dallied and finally selected the other side of the river. People who had come to speculate left their jobs. Houses were closed. Lots had to be sold for thousands less than what they were bought for. Then taxes finally took them, and they were forgotten. Men like Edgar Piper, who with his brother George had started a newspaper in Grace Harbor City, moved to Portland, and George Piper became the editor of the Portland Oregonian. James W. Gilbert and Chester C. Congdon sought to recoup their fortunes east of the mountains. In the rich Yakima Valley, they pioneered among the apple orchards and amassed fortunes. But there were others who hung on. In 1914, Adolf Yeager, Hale and Hardy at 78 and his wife, were the sole survivors of what had been planned for a great city. Occasionally visitors made the trip down the harbor to see the silent buildings standing among the alder thickets that had already begun to undo man's work. The visitors were told the story by the Yeagers as he pointed to the crumbling roofs. I paid $1,000 for my lot and built my house for $1,600, Jaeger told him. It was 1890 when I opened my tailor shop here on Summit Street. When I moved here, this street was graded all the way to Grass Creek. And over there, over that, was Broadway. Yes, that was the story of Grace Harbor City. And one time, I visited the place. I was just a child perhaps 1915 or 1916, and walk through the deserted streets and saw for myself. But before we get into my personal anecdotes, I want to take a few minutes for our friend Dick Crombie and words from our sponsor. As I said, it was about 1915 or 1916 that we walked through the streets of Grays Harbor City. I was too young to know the whole story, but I recall the rows of vacant buildings, the paint washed off, if they ever had any on it. And I remember my dad telling the story of how people had contributed to make the city there. Well, it was then ten years later. I went back again. By this time, most of the buildings were down, but the hotel still held together and the saloon alongside it. I met an old painter there who had once worked on the, on the newspaper long before. Bob Smith was his name. And he was having what I strong surmise was a last look at the city. The ghosts anywhere, I asked. And he pointed towards the saloon. I'd been watching them playing cards in there. Yep, there was the saloon. I don't reckon they will bother us much here on, but it was that kind of place. Bret Hart would feel right at home. There's been many 
a scourging roughhousing started from a card game in this bish banged and hurtful men of the old nigh hurt the Chinese who sleeved oozed cards. Here was stories, stories to be had of what was. Here, me reeling off the language of truthful James, don't know what to put the idea in my head unless I was thinking over the old days in California. It was a right place to be, fast moving, hot popping, and people set their sights on the stars right here. The old fellow had one set tight in the Overland Monthly Shop where Bret Hart was filling the holes in the type with stories scratched on the back of an envelope, and the printer and his ghost and finally, the ghosts alone, Grace Harbor City belongs. Its obituary was published in the Hoquiam, Washingtonian along about 1892. The editor, turning from his type to look out the window, watched a line of wagons hauling equipment from Grace Harbor City. It was the last trip for them. Bill, he called to the printer, Shove this line into the form before you go to press. Terminus terminated. That was all, and it did. But still, it's an interesting city as Grace Harbor goes, and it fills a prominent spot in this, our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>